You're listening to a message delivered at First Family Church in Bondurant, Iowa, from a sermon series, Son of God, Servant of Man, going through the Gospel of Mark. For more information and messages, please visit our website at www.ffcblife.com. In my opinion, one of the saddest realities of our current American culture is the way we as Americans view people from the Middle East, particularly Muslims. And it's understandable. In the wake of 9-11, we discovered as a nation that there is a group of people who want to destroy us, who want to kill us. So that's understandable. But the way we view them is apparent in many ways. I mean, you see it in movies, right? You rarely, if ever, see a Middle Easterner or a Muslim in a good light in our movies. Usually, they're the terrorists. They're the group of people who want to kill us, who want to bomb us, whom they view as the big or great Satan. You even see it in social media, especially among conservatives. I frequently see memes on social media that say something like, Muslims want to take away your freedom and institute Sharia law, keep America free and kick them out. You know, you ever seen stuff like that? I do. Maybe it's friends I hang around with. I don't know. (laughs) You laugh, but most of you are my friends. So (laughs) I don't know what to say about that. (laughs) Now, I mean, you know, in the wake of 9-11, I mean, America, the United States as a nation, we learned that we needed to defend ourselves, right? And if you know anything about Sharia law, you know that it goes against the grain, so to speak, of our constitutional freedoms as Americans. Sharia law, if you know, is a cruel and absolute system because it's based on a cruel and absolute faith system. Here's where the sad reality is, I think. Our our portrayal or our understanding of Islam, which many times is accurate, I believe causes us to view Middle Eastern people, particularly Muslims, as enemies and not as people created in the image of God like everyone else. We look at them with suspicion. We look at them with contempt. And we don't look at them as fellow human beings. They are different than us. Yes, some of them hate us. Yes, some of them do want to kill us. But they are no less and they are no more sinful than we are. All of us need a Savior. All of us are sinners. In today's passage, we're going to witness a group of self-righteous Pharisees who thought they were better than everyone else. And they looked at others who were not like them with contempt. They thought others were beneath them. They had no compassion. And they had no concern. They viewed others that were not like them as enemies. And yet, what they failed to realize is that these Pharisees were just as sinful as the people they looked on with contempt. And you know what? So is everyone else. That includes us. Yet there is hope. Because there is a Savior. And His name is Jesus, right? So open your Bibles if you're not there to Mark chapter 2. We're going to be going through verses 13 through 17 as we learn more about our Savior Jesus and how he levels the playing field when it comes to everyone being equal in their sin. As usual, I'll attempt to answer any questions you have regarding this message, and you text that in, and I'll do that or do my best to address those questions. So, today's passage. It's the first of three passages where we will see and observe and learn from Jesus as we find him in... uh, confronted by the Jewish leaders, particularly the Pharisees. 
where they question him what he does and what he says, and where he answers them. Really what's going on in these next three passages is that Jesus is exposing self-righteousness for what it is. And we're going to see in the next three passages how he deals with self-righteous, prideful, arrogant sinners. So, Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. And he went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him. And he was teaching them. As he passed by, verse 14, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he, that is Matthew, got up and followed him. This is the call of Levi. As we look at Q&A with Jesus part 1, this first section, the call of Levi, or whom we more commonly know as Matthew. Here's the call of Levi or Matthew. Now, At the beginning, in verse 13, we find Jesus doing what Jesus does. He's teaching the people the gospel of the kingdom. If Jesus is anything, He is consistent. Right? We've seen Him do this at the beginning of His ministry and all throughout His ministry so far. The seashore that He walks by as He's teaching the people would have been the seashore of Galilee, which really wasn't a sea because we usually reserve that term for the ocean. But in their defense, the Sea of Galilee was pretty large. It was eight miles in length and five miles in width, so we give him a pass. But that's the seashore he is walking by as he's teaching the people. Mark then tells us that he passes by a man named Levi, or the son of Alphaeus, or Matthew, as we more commonly know him. And it tells us that Matthew is in a tax booth, or that Matthew is a tax collector. Now, tax collectors collected taxes for Rome. They would tax income, they would tax land, and they would tax goods. They would also tax goods that were in transit. If you think of it in in modern terms, the trucks that carry goods back and forth across the country, the way they would do that is on roads, through caravans, and the government would tax those goods. Matthew works at one of those tax booths or toll booths to collect on the goods that are being transported through the land. And where Matthew lives in Capernaum, it's right in between two major cities where there was a lot of trade. Damascus in Syria and a little bit south and west from Capernaum in Caesarea, which was in the land of Israel. A lot of commerce, a lot of trade would have gone through that route. And Matthew was there to tax it all. What does that tell us? Matthew was a wealthy man. He had a good thing going. In fact, we know he's a wealthy man because later on in the passage, we're going to see that he hosts a dinner for Jesus and it says many people were there in his home or at his table meaning he had a large house. Now, he would have lived in Capernaum, being really close to this tax booth. And living in Capernaum, he would have heard Jesus. right? We have already seen that Jesus uses Capernaum, where Andrew and Peter live, as one of his base of operations, or his main base of operation in Galilee. Matthew would have Heard of this Jesus? Remember where we've already read that the, that the whole town came to hear Him and to, to witness what He did and what He said? Matthew would have heard of, the, of Jesus. He would have known who He was. Would have probably witnessed some of His miracles. Would have heard Him preach the Gospel of the Kingdom. Jesus knew who Matthew was. I kind of picture as Jesus had been teaching and doing uh, miracles in Capernaum, in my mind I kind of think Jesus, Jesus had noticed Matthew, this tax collector who worked at the tax booth, was there to hear him preach on the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus no doubt knew Matthew was ready to respond to what Jesus was saying. In other words, he knew Matthew was ready to repent. So he says to Matthew, or Levi, as it says. 
He says, follow me. And Matthew responds. And he gets up and follows him. Now, the reason Matthew obeyed is because he understood what Jesus is talking about here. He had heard Jesus teach. He knew what his message was. He knew that Jesus was demanding repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And Matthew had listened to it, had thought about it. And when Jesus comes and commands him, follow me, Matthew's ready. He's ready to respond. Now, you need to understand when Matthew responds, what he's giving up. I've already told you, Matthew was a wealthy man. He was a tax collector. And when Jesus commands Matthew to follow him, Matthew had a choice to make. He could either choose to remain where he was as a tax collector, which means he would continue to be wealthy, he would continue to enjoy all that he has, or he could give it up and follow Jesus. And the reason I say that is because Matthew couldn't just leave the tax booth and then say, you know what, this Jesus thing ain't working out. I think I'm going to go back to my old job. It didn't work that way. You left that role. There were like 50 guys chomping at the bit to take your spot. Everybody wanted that spot. And Matthew, unlike Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they could go back to their fishing business. In fact, they did for a little bit. Matthew couldn't go back to the tax booth. But rather than live in the lap of luxury, rather than continue in his lifestyle of sin, which we'll see here in a moment, Matthew chose to obey and respond and follow Jesus. Now when Jesus calls Matthew to follow Him, we need to understand what He's demanding here. Jesus is calling Matthew to make a choice. Jesus is telling Matthew, Matthew, it's all or nothing. Are you in or are you out? And you know what? That call that Jesus gives Matthew is not unique. It wasn't just for him. It's actually for all of us. Jesus commands everyone to do the same. Or simply put, when Jesus calls you to follow him, it's all or nothing. That's the choice Jesus is telling us to make. In the same way that Matthew could not remain in his, uh, his present lifestyle, neither can any of us who claim to follow Jesus. Jesus demands. He commands complete loyalty. Jesus isn't asking to be a part of our life. He wasn't asking that of Matthew. He is asking to be our life. He's not asking for a merger. He is asking for a benevolent takeover. He was asking that of Matthew, and he asks that of everyone. You cannot choose to follow Jesus part-time. You cannot choose to follow Him half-heartedly. He demands everything. A decision to not follow Him completely is a decision not to follow Him. You cannot hold on to some of your sin if you decide to follow Jesus. Now, true of Matthew and anyone else, is, I mean, Jesus is not expecting those who follow Him to no longer sin. We know that's not true. That's ridiculous. None of us apart from being glorified in the new heavens and the new earth, are sinless. We still sin. Right? We know that. He is, though, commanding and demanding of us, like He is Matthew and everyone else, to address our sin. And to follow Him no matter what. To make Him the most important person in our lives even more important than ourselves. And let's admit it, that's, an, that's a hard pill to swallow, right? For it means that we need to be willing to reject our lifestyles of self-indulgence and living for self and choose as a lifestyle to live for Him. It means that we're willing to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to Him as He speaks to us in His Word and follow what He says in His Word. This is a process. It begins at the moment of redemption, the moment of salvation, when we beg God for forgiveness because of Christ, based on His grace and His mercy, because of what He did, and embrace Him as our Master and as our Lord. Listen to this. Jesus is patient with our sin. Don't misunderstand that. But Jesus is not tolerant of our sin. 
What I mean is, he knows it's a process. He knows we will struggle, but he will not allow us to ignore it. He demands us to address it. We can't think to ourselves, well, you know what, it doesn't matter what I do because Jesus will forgive me anyway. Jesus will not allow us to get away with that. Make no mistake, when he calls us to follow him like he did Matthew, it's an all or nothing decision. Matthew knew this. And we will see in a moment, so did his friends. We need to know this. We need to be reminded of this. So after Matthew responds to Jesus' call, which I would identify as Matthew's moment of conversion, he follows Jesus. After this happens, it gets really interesting. Because this group of religious leaders known as the Pharisees, the separated ones, they would have observed what had just happened. We know that they've been sent from all around Israel to come check Jesus out. And they were among the throngs, the crowds, that came to hear and witness what Jesus did. And they would have been shocked by his call of Matthew. And we're going to see they later view him with contempt. Look at verse 15. And it happened, this is after Matthew follows, or chooses to follow Jesus, and it happened that he, that's Jesus, was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Here's where we're going to witness the contempt of the Pharisees. The contempt of the Pharisees. Do you get it? You'll get it. Now, Mark merely tells us that Jesus reclines at his table. We have to figure out, okay, whose table and, and, and whose house is this? Fortunately, Luke tells us whose house this is and whose table it is. Luke tells us it's Matthew's house. It's his table. Luke also also tells us that when Matthew hosts this reception, that there was a great crowd of tax collectors and sinners. His friends. Mark tells us many, right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this was a large group of people. This was a large party. Here's another fun fact. Look at where Matthew says... For there were many of them, in the end of verse 15, and they were following him. Mark is the only one who adds, and they were following him. He's the only gospel writer who adds that little fact. Now, we need to ask ourselves, who are they? What is, who does they refer to in that passage? Is he talking about his disciples, or is he talking about the many tax collectors and sinners. It's the latter. He's talking about the tax collectors and the sinners. How can I say that? Well, up to this point, and really throughout the Gospels, the predominant use or the main use of the word disciples refers to the group of men whom we know as the twelve who would later become apostles. That's the major use of that term, disciples. Now, if he's talking about the disciples, at this point there's only four. Matthew's the fifth. So it doesn't make sense to identify the many as only being five men. Does it? Also, when you look at the the grammar of, of the passage, the many refers to the tax collectors and the sinners. Okay, so the many were following him. What does that word follow mean? 
Well, we ask ourselves, how is that term, that word follow, used in the present passage? How is it being used? Well, it's first used in verse 14, where Jesus commands Matthew, follow me. And then it's used again, and it says, he followed him. Now, unless the context tells us otherwise, we have to believe that it means the same thing if it's used in the next verse. What did it mean to Matthew? Matthew. It meant to repent of your sin, reject your old lifestyle, and follow me. Not only that, the verb following in verse 15 says that they didn't just, these many didn't just follow him to Matthew's house. It communicates it in such a way that it says they were continuously following Jesus. Simply put, these group of sinners did just as Matthew did and repented of their sin, and began to follow Jesus. They were attracted to Him, and they were drawn to Him, and it was for all the right reasons. It wasn't because they were there to see the miracles. It was because here is this man who claims to be the Messiah and say that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he says that it's offered to anyone who repents. And they were drawn by that. Of any of the people in Israel, no one would have thought that this would have been some of Jesus' earliest followers. And yet they are. This is why the Pharisees ask the question. This is why they look at Jesus with contempt. They're not just being curious here. They're being accusatory. When they ask the question, why is He eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? It's an accusation. They can't believe this. To to these people, it's ridiculous. How can this group of sinners follow a Jewish rabbi? And furthermore, how can this rabbi accept them as his followers? To, to To the Pharisees, this is a monumental scandal. This is unconscionable. If this if this would have happened today, this is this is probably what they would have tweeted. They would have said, Can you believe who Jesus hangs out with? Question mark. And it would have been like, hashtag, he's not my Messiah. Hashtag, no one is holier than a Pharisee. That was their mindset. Now you see where they asked Jesus, Jesus' disciples, why he's eating with them? What's the big deal about that? Well, in the ancient Near East, to sit down and have a meal, to recline at someone's table and enjoy a meal with them, it was a sign and symbol of intimate fellowship. It meant that if you were invited to recline at someone's table, it meant that you accepted them for who they were as people, and you didn't care who knew about it. They're welcome and they're accepted. In other words, Jesus is saying, this group of sinners is welcome to be with me. They're accepted. And for the Pharisees, this was too much. They couldn't handle it. They were the most aggressively religious people in the, in the first century in Israel. And they see Jesus with this group of sinners and they just, they don't get it. They don't get it. They couldn't fathom. Why would He do this? God calls us to be holy and to be separate from sinners. I mean, after all, Psalm chapter one or Psalm one, verse one says, "How blessed is the man!" And then it goes on to say what he doesn't do: who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, who doesn't stand in the path of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, why would they think that of these people? Well. Tax collectors, as I said before, basically worked for the Romans. And really not just the Pharisees, but for all Jews, they viewed Rome as their enemies. And they viewed tax collectors as traitors to Israel who got rich off their betrayal. In fact, listen to this. In, in the eyes of the Jews, and particularly the Pharisees, if a tax collector came into your house, you and your home became unclean. In fact, they even would say in their synagogues, you cannot accept alms, which is money for the poor, from a tax collector because their money is sinful. 
They even went as far as to say, you can lie. It's permitted to lie to a tax collector in order to protect your pro- property. They viewed these men as enemies, as scum. And then there are the people who are, would have been their tax collector's closest friends, these other sinners that Mark talks about. These would have included prostitutes, women who sell their body for money. It would have included thieves. It would have included liars. It would have included drunkards. It would have included thugs. Now think about what Matthew did. He's at the tax booth. He would have had thugs around him. He would have had enforcers in order to extort money out of the people. Oh, you don't want to pay me what I'm telling you owe me. Hey, Guido. Hey, Tiny Mike. Go take care of this guy. You know what I mean? They would have been there too. And what does Mark tell us? This group of people were many, and what? They were following Jesus. And the Pharisees are like, what in the world is going on? Why is Jesus doing this? How could He do that? How could He stoop so low? They ask the question, and Jesus gives an answer. Look what he says, verse 17. Let's read it again. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. His answer is pretty straightforward. He uses an illustration that they would understand. He doesn't beat around the bush. Right? Everyone would have understood what he meant. A healthy person doesn't need a physician, but a sick person does. And he equates sick people with sinners, and he equates the healthy as, quote-unquote, the righteous, or those whom he thought were, who thought they were righteous. So he's not saying here that these men are righteous. He's actually using sarcasm here. He's act, this is actually a verbal slap in the face to the Pharisees. I don't know if you noticed, but the way I read it, I did not come to call the righteous. He's putting it back at them. He's saying, you think you're righteous, but you're not. And not only would they have understood what he meant, everyone there would have understood what he meant. In other words, Jesus is saying, who do you think you are? You think you're righteous? You think you're worthy? You think you're better than everyone? I didn't come to talk to you if that's what you think. I came to talk to and proclaim the Gospel to people who are willing to admit they're sinners. I, the great physician, have come to heal sinners who are willing to repent of their sin. you got to love Jesus. I mean, no one can cut to the chase like as quickly as Jesus. I mean, he doesn't mince words. I mean, these self-righteous bigots think they're better than everyone. And with one response, Jesus just blows them out of the water. I mean, don't mess with Jesus. Right? Now, as always, there, there, is, there is a lot we can learn from what's going on here. We don't have time to address everything that we observe in this passage, but we have a couple more weeks on these issues, so we will do our best to address all of them. But for now, I want to discuss three lessons we can learn, or three takeaways that we can learn from this account. And the first one is this. Meeting someone in their sin is very different from affirming them in their sin. Now, you may not be aware of this, maybe you are, but there are some who use this passage that we just read as an excuse for not addressing people in their sin. And just look past it. They would say, well, Jesus seems to be more comfortable with sinners than He does with religious people. I mean, if he was here today, Jesus would have hung out with 
the junkies, the prostitutes, the drunkards, and the homosexuals, not church people. And they go on to say, I mean, who are we? I mean, if that's what Jesus did, who are we to judge anyone for their sin? We just need to love them and accept them. I mean, that's what Jesus did. We don't need to address their sin. They don't need to repent. We just need to accept them for who they are. Like Jesus, it is said. We just need to ignore them. Or ignore their sin and tell them Jesus loves them no matter how they live or no matter what they think. Now you need to understand that is a complete misunderstanding of what's going on here in this passage and what Jesus is saying. And what's sad, those who are saying this, they're not outside the church, they're inside the church. And many of them are church leaders. Now, you might ask, I do, why would they do that? Why would they not want to address people's sin? Why would they not want to confront it, albeit in a loving, compassionate, but clear way? Here's, my, here's what I think. And you, and you know this. The culture is aggressively pushing everyone, including Christians who hold to biblical truth, to just not be so absolute about sin. And not just that, but to affirm people in their sin. And not call them to repent. And I think the people who are beginning to say these things, I think they they believe they found a biblical reason to give in to the pressure. But this isn't what Jesus is saying. Yes, Jesus met people in their sin, but what does he say about them? He says they're sick. Right? What's he saying? He's not ignoring their sin. He's addressing it head on. I mean, this is his entire message. He, 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 this clarion call. The kingdom of God is at hand and I as your king command you to repent from your sin so that you can be forgiven. This is his consistent message. And he says, the great physician, whom he identifies as himself, has come to heal the sinful and the sick. Not those who think they don't need it. That's why these people were attracted to him. Everyone considered them as outcasts. No one would come near them except their own friends. And Jesus comes and says, repent and anyone can come. So what does this mean for us? It means that we, like Jesus, need to be willing to meet people in their sin. Not affirm it, but meet them where they're at. And that's messy sometimes. Let's just admit that. It's hard. It's difficult to get into the mud and grime of people's lives and call them to reject their sin and embrace Jesus as their only hope, as their Savior. It's not easy, but it's necessary. To ignore sin in someone's life, or your life for that matter, is like ignoring a terminal illness. I mean, what? How do we use that term, terminal illness? It usually refers to that a person has a condition or a disease that will end in their death. It will kill them. Sin is a terminal disease. And it is far more serious than a physical disease. Because it ends in eternal, ongoing judgment and torment. Why would we affirm people who have this disease and not point them to the only cure in Christ? We need to meet them in their sin. But that doesn't mean we need to affirm what they're doing. The next lesson I'd like to talk about that I believe that comes in this passage has to do with Matthew and his friends. And it's simply this. Sin always delivers much less than it promises always delivers much less than it promises. Now, Matthew, the tax collector, and his large group of friends were the type of people who lived for the moment. I mean, if they had a motto, it would be, it would be something like, live life to the fullest, get what you can, enjoy what you want, do whatever makes you feel good because it doesn't really matter. 
they would have bought into the enemy's lie that sin isn't, it's not that bad. It doesn't really matter how you live as long as it makes you happy. Go ahead and fulfill any desire you have and get it any way you can. It doesn't matter. There's plenty for the taken or for the taking. You know what though? Matthew and his friends were not unique. Everyone is like this. Or at least used to be like this. They are like us. We are like them. However, after indulging in every desire life could offer, what do Matthew and his friends choose to do? What did they discover? Well, they discovered that, they, that living life for all that it gives in their sin and doing whatever they want, what did they discover? It leaves them wanting. It leaves them thirsty for something else. How can I say that? Why else would they have rejected it if they were happy, if they were fulfilled, if they were content? I mean, these people, I mean, Matthew, let's talk about, he had wealth, he had power, he had friends, he had stuff. He could have anything he wanted. And yet when Jesus says, follow me, Matthew says, forget all of that. I'm tired of all that. It doesn't fulfill me. It doesn't satisfy me. I want something more. For years, they thought life was all about themselves. But they discovered it was fun for a while. But then it got old and left them feeling empty. They had discovered that sin always delivers much less than it promises. You see, the the pleasures of sin are temporary. They're fun for a while, but they will always lead to disappointment and the feeling of being unfulfilled. Listen to this. This is Hebrews chapter 11. It's speaking of Moses. Verse 25, it says, Moses choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than enjoy, listen to this, the passing pleasures of sin. What's that passage saying? Well, it's admitting that there is pleasure in sin. Would you you agree? It's admitting, yeah, there is some fun for a a time. But they're temporary. They're only for a moment. They will not fulfill you. They promise you the world, but they actually will deliver you to hell. The pleasures of sin are temporary. They are a counterfeit. For those of you, if there's anybody in this room, if you have not responded to To Jesus, He's calling you. He's saying to you, sin is empty. It will not fulfill you. It will not satisfy you. You are not designed to live for sin. You are designed to be fulfilled in Him. And He's calling you to trust Him. To look past what you feel. And trust what He says. For those of us who who have repented of our sin, who do follow Jesus, He's reminding us, don't go back to what you used to live for. Remember where it leads. He's reminding us to trust Him. Only in Him, as we see in the example of Matthew and his friends, can we be fulfilled. Here's the last lesson I think we can learn from this passage. Correct theology does not guarantee godliness. Correct theology does not guarantee godliness. Where do I get that? Now, this might be, not be immediately apparent if you don't know that much about the Pharisees. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Of all the Jewish sects, and there were several of them, you know, we had Sadducees, we had Pharisees, we had the Essenes, that's where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had the Zealots. There were many sects within first century Judaism. The Pharisees, the guys in the passage, they were the ones who had the most in common with Jesus than any other sect. What I mean is that theologically, these group, or this group of Pharisees were more in line 
or I should say maybe more biblical than any other Jewish sect. Think about this. They held to the literal interpretation of the scriptures. Not all the sects did. Other divisions did not hold to that. They believed that there was a coming Messiah. Not all of them believed that. They believed that all of the Old Testament was the Word of God. The Sadducees only believed the first five books were the Word of God. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in the existence of angels. They believed in a very balanced view of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. That was the Pharisees. They had good theology. You could read their theology and be like, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's good. However, for most of them, because we only know of a few Pharisees that came to faith in Christ, for most of them, this good theology, correct biblical theology, did not produce godliness. It did not produce humble submission to Jesus and an acute awareness of their own sin. It didn't lead them to accept Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah, even though they had the correct theology. I mean, there's a reason why Jesus always tells them this que- or asks them this question. Have you never read? In other words, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You just are unwilling, you're unwilling to submit to it. And you fail to understand what it means. They forgot, or maybe had never known, that God desires mercy and compassion more than He does sacrifice. In fact, this story, as Matthew records it, He records that Jesus asked them that question. He he quotes Hosea 6.6. And he says, go learn what this means. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. But they missed it. The Pharisees failed to understand that it doesn't matter how much you do for God. You cannot earn favor with God. You can't earn forgiveness. You can't do enough good things. God can't be bargained with. He is the standard and nobody can meet it. They failed to understand this. The only way, and Jesus was very clear, the only way to approach God is through humble repentance of sin. Any human attempt to earn God's favor is worthless and will get you nowhere. It doesn't matter. Listen to this. It doesn't matter what you know. What matters is what you do with what you know. Just because you have the, the right theology doesn't mean anything. I mean, listen, this is what Paul meant when he wrote this in Philippians. He says, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. I was circumcised the eighth day like a good Jew. Of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, I was an expert. That's what Pharisees were. They were experts on the law. As to zeal, I persecuted the church. As to righteousness, which is found in the law, I was blameless. I followed all the rules, Paul says. But he goes on to say, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, he goes on to say, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. You know what that last phrase means? You know what Paul is saying? He's saying, good theology without humble submission is a big pile of crap. That's what that word rubbish means. Excrement. Dung. Fertilizer. Why would Paul use that word? Because it would have been shocking. It would have been attention-grabbing. Now, you know this. Those of you who have been here for any period of time, you know that we take care and will continue to do so to understand what does this book say. We're going to teach you what this says, what it means, and we strive to be faithful to do that and give you the Word of God. We need to be reminded of this. Just because we know what's right doesn't mean much unless we follow it. You know, 
You know what God thinks? I'll end with this. You know what God thinks of repentance when we're willing to admit that we can't measure up, that we need Him, that we need His mercy, that we we need to cast ourselves upon His grace? Here's what God thinks. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 15. He says, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven. Who's in heaven? That's God. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. What's he saying? God is thrilled and overjoyed when we humble ourselves and follow what He says and say, I'm not worthy. Forgive me. All I have is Christ. When we do that, there is joy in heaven. And God is pleased. So to summarize this in one sentence, I'd say it this way. Jesus rejects self-righteous sinners, but gives grace to any and all humble sinners who repent. Any and all. doesn't matter what you, where you come from, what you've done, what your past is like. Jesus doesn't matter. If you come humbly, you are welcome at my table. And I accept you. And your sin, which are many, I will forgive. Amen? Did we get any questions? We got one? Let's see what it says. Who or how or why did Levi's name change to Matthew? Okay, good question. So Levi would have been his uh, Jewish name. Like many people of this day, he either had a second name, Matthew is more of a Greek name, Why was it changed? It could be that Jesus changed it. Or it could be he had that second name because he was in Galilee of the Gentiles where Greek was spoken and probably adopted that name uh, to be more relatable to all the other nations that passed through. So it's interesting that his his Jewish name was Levi because that may mean he was part of the priestly tribe of Levi which is, makes some sense when you read his gospel. Because out of all four gospels, Matthew's has the most Jewishness to it. Matthew probably knew the scriptures from when he was a little boy. He went off, but as the prodigal son, he comes back. As the band comes forward and as we get ready to remember Jesus and what He did at the cross, I got one thought for you. No one is ever worthy of Jesus. But everyone who is willing to admit that and turn from their sin and embrace Him is welcome at His table. Father, thank You for sending our Savior Jesus. Thank You for His ministry and His example. Thank You for what He said to us. For the assurance of redemption that can be found in Him when we repent and embrace Him. We could never do what You did, but we will praise You forever for doing it. Amen.